Hey guys, Cav here. This is our uh, whole class learning from Unit 1, American Voices. Now there are two pieces of whole class learning. One of them is Quilt of a Country, which is in this video. The other one is the immig Immigrant Contribution from JFK, and it's a speech. And that's in the YouTube video. That will be added as a link after this video, so in that same space. So you're going to need to watch both of those. You're going to need to look at how they're similar, how they're different, what are they both saying. Write that down. This uh, Quilt of a Country is on page 13 in your text. And there are questions on pages 17, 18, and 19. Um, and then, if I'm correct, there should be a text version. Okay, there's a text version of The Immigrant Contribution by JFK. And that starts on page 23 in your book. So if you would rather just read it, or if you want to read it and listen along, feel free to do that. So, here we go. This is the quilt of the country. America is an improbable idea, a, nation, a mongrel nation built of ever-changing disparate parts, held together by a notion, the notion that all men are created equal, though everyone knows that most men consider themselves better than someone. Of all the nations in the world, the United States was built in nobody's image, the historian David Borstein writes. That's because it was built of bits and pieces that seem discordant, like the crazy quilts that have been one of its great folk art forms, velvet and calico and checks and brocades. Out of many, one. That is the ideal. The nation, the reality is often quite different, a great national striving, consisting frequently of failure. Many of the oft-told stories of the most pluralistic nation on earth are stories not of tolerance, but of bigotry. Sla slavery in sweatshops, the burning of crosses, and the ostracism of the other. Children learn in social studies class and in the news of the lynching of blacks, the denial of right to women, rights to women, and the murders of gay men. It is difficult to know how to convince them that this amounts to crown thy good with brotherhood, that amid all the failures is something spectacularly successful. Perhaps they understand it at this moment, when enormous tragedy, as this so often does, demands a time of reflection on enormous blessing. There is a nation founded on a conundrum. This is a nation founded on a conundrum, what Mario Cuomo has characterized as community added to individualism. These two are our defining ideals. They are also in constant conflict. Historians today bemoan the essentiality a sensitivity of a kind of prideful apathard in America. Okay. Da -da -da -da. That is a system of racial segregation and discrimination. In America, saying that clinging to ethnicity and background and custom has undermined the concept of unity. These historians must have forgotten the past or have gilded it. The New York of my children is no more balkanized, probably less so than the Philadelphia of my father in which Jewish boys would walk several blocks out of their way to avoid the Irish divide of Chester Avenue. I was the product of, mis of a mixed marriage across barely bridgeable lines, an Italian girl, an Irish boy. How quaint it seems now, how incendiary then. The Brooklyn of Frankie Nolan's famous tree, the new work of which Potnoy complained, even the uninflicted wasp suburbs of Cheever's characters. They are ghettos, pure and simple. Do the Cambodians and the Mexicans in California coexist less easily today than did the Irish and Italians of Massachusetts a century ago? You know the answer. What is the point of this splintered hole? What is the point of a nation in which Arab cabbies chauffeur, Jew chauffeur Jewish passengers to the streets of New York, and in which Jewish, pa Jewish cabbies chauffeur Arab passengers too, and yet speak in theory of hatred one for the other? What is the point of a nation in which one part seems always on the verge of fisticuffs, fisticuffs with another, blacks and whites, gays and straights, left and right, Poles, Pole and Chinese and Puerto Rican and Slovenian? Other countries with such division have in fact divided into new nations with new names, but not this one, impossibly interwoven even in its hostilities. Once these desperate parts were held together by a common enemy, by the fault lines of world wars and the electrified fence of communism, with the end of the Cold War, there was a creeping concern that without a focus for hatred and distrust, the sense of national identity would evaporate. The left side of the hyphen, Irish-American, Mexican-American, African-American, would overwhelm the right. And the slow-growing domestic traumas like economic unrest and increasing crime seemed more likely to emphasize division than community. Today, the citizens of the United States have come together once more because of armed conflict and enemy attack. Terrorism has led to devastation and unity. Yet, even in 1994, the overwhelming majority of those surveyed by the National Opinion Research Center agree with this sentiment. This statement. 
The U.S. is a unique country that stands for something special in the world. One of the things that it stands for is this vexing notion that a great nation can consist entirely of refugees from other nations, that people of different, even warring religions and cultures can live, if not side by side, than on either side of the country's Chester Avenues. Faced with this diversity, there is little point in trying to isolate anything, remotely resembling a national character, but there are two strains of behavior that, however tenuous, tenuous, tenuously, abet the concept of unity. There is a Calvinist undercurrent in the American psyche that loves the difficult, the demanding, that sees mastering the impossible, whether it be prairie or subway, as a test of character, and so glories in this struggle of fractured coalescing. Excuse me. And there is a grudging fairness among the citizens of the United States that eventually leads most to admit that, no matter what the English-only advocates try to suggest, the new immigrants are not so different from our own parents or grandparents. Lionel Castillo, Castillo, former director of the Immigration and Naturalization Service, and himself the grandson of Mexican immigrants, once told the writer Studs Terkel proudly, The old neighborhood ma pa stores are still around. They are not Italian or Jewish or Eastern European anymore. Ma and pa are now Korean, Vietnamese, Iraqi, Jordanian, Latin American. They live in the store. They work seven days a week. Their kids are doing well in school. They're making it. Sound familiar? Tolerance is the word most often used when this kind of coexistence succeeds, but tolerance is a vanilla pudding word, standing for little more than the allowance of letting others live unremarked and unmolested. Pride seems excessive, given the American willingness to endlessly complain about them, them being whoever is new, different, unknown, or currently under suspicion. But patriotism is partly taking pride in this unlikely ability to throw all of us together in a country that is across its length and breadth as different as a dozen countries and still able to call, by, call it by one name. When photographs of the faces of all those who died in the World Trade Center destruction are assembled in one place, it will be possible to trace the skin color, the shape of the eyes and the nose, the texture of the hair, a map of the world. These are the representations of a mongrel nation that sometimes, at times like this, has one spirit. Like many improbable ideas, when it actually works, it's a wonder. That was written in 2001. All right. Have a wonderful day, guys. Cab out.